Thank you. <clears throat> so thank you all for being here. I'm the last one bringing up the rear, so we'll see what happens. I read once that ancient cartographers didn't make maps to navigate the world. Instead, they made maps to claim their place in it. First tattoos. A lover showed me pictures of her belly stretch marks and their likeness she found twinned on the tree just outside her window. I imagined those ciphers curved across her skin like the tattoo an Aisuki makes as it angles through the soft or hard of wood. Or that they waved as two people facing a tree's body peel away bark, then curve their names in its buttery flesh, a couplet caged in the open mouth of a heart. These are some of the markings made on a body, those points that line the name of the lover brailed on the bicep of the sailor, or the child sketched on the scapula of the mother. Those are the voluntary latitudes visible across surface that makes traversing the landscape of another less quest and more homecoming. But what of the markings in? The arbitrary landing of longitude or an inking that settles in the soil at surface, rises to relief, then pounds underground to sound a topography of depression. See, there are so many ways people are made map by moments. The contours creased in the horizontal plane of her cheek, the creek cut from the curve of his knife on her neck, the cave flooded by the fingers of a grandfather, all this hatching heaved on the heart by a hand. <clears throat> so hi, my name's Denise. Oh, you're good, you're good. But you're better than the crowd that caught on last, took a little while to catch on last night. Uh, my name is Denise and I'm a poet. So one of the things I really wanna talk about tonight is how as a poet, Sometimes, if you love a poet, or if you know a poet, or if you are a poet, we have this strange kind of addiction to crazy emotional moments, and then we have withdrawal when things are calm, right? So it's very difficult sometimes to love a poet or be a poet, but that's what I am. So now that you've caught on to the, hi, Denise, we'll try one more time, because I've got one more thing. So, hi, my name is Denise, and I'm afraid of maps. So really it's true, uh, I am afraid of maps. I have been for a long time. And I grew up with a father who really loved to put a map in front of my sister and I to teach us how to navigate on our own. And my sister and I still don't know how to use paper maps, but we've tried really hard. Um, and so what I've really wanted to do for a long time is figure out what maps are about. <laughs> oh yeah, okay, the heroin. I was like, what are you looking at? Um, so yes, definitely. Um, one of the things that I've really been trying to figure out is what my fascination is about maps. So when I was, uh, fast forward like 15 years or so, and I realized that the maps I was growing up with were not my own. I started to navigate in my life around the points and people and places that were made for me. And so what I had to learn how to do is to figure out how to map on my own. I realized that almost all the women I dated and my former wife all loved maps so much, so much, and they wanted me to learn how to navigate. But what I enjoyed when I was a kid is when AAA was invented, right? Do you remember that? You remember those triptychs? It was heaven. So what I got to do is when triptychs were invented, I didn't have to learn how to navigate with north and south or east and west anymore. I got to learn how to navigate with left and right. And so when I was in third grade, I was a really big tomboy. I loved everything that had to do with dirt and roads and ramps. And so I was riding my uh, skateboard one day and I forgot to jump off at the bottom of a big hill. And so what happened is I fell off, I hit my head, and when I woke up, my arm was broken. It was my right arm. So it was really easy then to learn how to navigate left or right. It was super easy because I knew from my arm. So again, fast forward to that 15 years when all of the women that I loved wanted me to learn how to navigate um, using maps. Of course I tried, right? So for about 20 years, I was back to my love-hate relationship with paper maps. And all of my intimate relationships with people, with women, were like my intimate relationships with maps. They were really beautiful. I found them fascinatingly beautiful. But when we actually really had to communicate and talk to each other, 
it was a very scary thing for me. It was very difficult. That is until my relationship shifted and until MapQuest was invented, <laughs> right? So now I had this new turn-by-turn -turn voice that got me everywhere I needed to go. So Siri or girlfriends, mm, take your pick. So I learned to make it through the world without relying on lines and grids and north and south and east and west. My way of navigating the world became stars and syllables and sound and metaphor and all of those things that really helped me to get around. But the problem was that I still was afraid of maps, right? So about five or six years ago, I got offered this really wonderful fellowship at this place called Hedgebrook. And it was in Puget Sound, and I had this cabin in the woods all by myself, and I got to pick my project. So you would think that I would stay away from maps, wouldn't you? No. As a poet and a glutton for punishment, and just loving digging into that emotional part that I said earlier, remember, that addiction piece, I decided that I was going to focus on maps as my project. So remember how I began my talk, saying that ancient cartographers didn't try um, to make maps to navigate the world. They made maps to find their place in it, right? When I ran across that quote, and I began to dig and dig and dig and read and find everything out I could about maps, and I ran across that quote, suddenly map became metaphor, and metaphor became every single moment and every single person and every single experience I'd had up until that point in my life. And I realized that what I was af wasn't afraid of was maps, but what I was really afraid of is knowing myself on a really deep level and claiming my place in the world. That was the scary thing to me. It was my fear of communicating with myself, with understanding myself, and with being present. See, I'd grown up in an experience where uh, I never felt like I had the right to claim my place. And I also had grown up with a mom who died when I was one and she was 21. And so I had this feeling that I wouldn't even be here for long. So how could I claim my place? Why should I claim my place? And what right did I have to even claim my place? And then I read another quote by David Greenhood. And it said, artists and map makers call the ups and downs of surface its relief. Ups and downs, as anyone who has done any walking knows, alters distances. These physical features of an area natural and man-made, are called its topography. So what I realized is that I needed to set about to map my own top topography. I needed to figure out how I could get closer to myself. So one of the questions I asked myself is, in map making, I should say this first, in map making, one of the things that map makers do is they have to build their maps around fixed points in order for the map to be true or navigable. In order for somebody to get to their destination, a map maker can't map a, make a map around a tree, for example, because it could be cut down or uprooted at any time, right? And so then, if the map that you're navigating by is mapped around that, but that tree isn't there, you won't make it to your destination. So that's the first premise. No matter what kind of map, whether it's a topographic map, whether it's a contour map, whether it's a field map, they all have to be round, made around a fixed point. So that's step one. And the other thing that David Greenhood said is that the easiest kind of map to navigate with is a fenced and post method map. And he said that if you're learning maps for the first time, which I was, trying to get to know them in an intimate way, that you should use the fence and post method and you should find yourself, find, figure out how to locate yourself in your own backyard. So I thought, why not? Let's try it. So what I did was I asked myself these questions. I asked myself, what points have I navigated around? What people and places and things have I fixed my life around so that where I am now has everything to do with where I came from? And so if I've been doing that, I realized that I was navigating around somebody else's map my whole life. And so what I wanted to do is ask myself the questions, what have I fixed around, who have I fixed around, and how? And so of course, as a poet, I hope you're ready for another poem, but of course, as a poet, what came out for me is another poem. So, this is called How to Locate Yourself in Your Own Backyard. And each of the steps that are up there are actually from Greenhood's book. So, step one, 
Take notice of recognizable things. Later, you can exchange the simple smooth of trailer white and green aluminum for the complicated body of brick. So stick first to landmarks. Those at eye level are easiest to locate. See first the shed in the back right corner. It is opposite of you, and so point the tip of your nose at its corner seam. Tilt your head slightly up if you'd like. Since this structure seems to know how you always hated its unashamed not to be a garage or dollhouse stance. Then, just glance at it. After all, it's no Narnia wardrobe. It could never clothe itself in mahogany or cypress to help you enter and exit privilege at your leisure. Step two. Understand your whereabouts. This is where you will, you will decide it may be easier for you to landmark the absence of things. No mother, no dog, no swing set, no gas grill to replace the dollar store charcoal chewing saucer sized one whose legs planted in the soil seem just as uncertain as yours. But if what you can't see still keeps you from navigating, walk it off. Let your limbs lay the land. Legs first. Trust me, you will want, I know, to map by striding. But don't until you find and fix your memory in first steps. Start again where you entered. Corner left heel to right so that the angle is. Line it properly so that if it, that not Narnia wardrobe shed closed the space between its corner and your heart center, it would have you. We'll name that point origin. Next, plant left hill, then turn it counterclockwise till you feel the push and give of earth. Then raise arms as if you are ready to embrace your splitting. Step three, know your position in space. To do this, use the fence and post method. Cite the lines left as your fingertips point to fence posts. Take notes of their picket. Notice they are not wooden and white and straight as the teeth that bear up the smiles of well-loved women. They are the brown, red, and rugged gaping of the splintered enamel and thin bone of the female bodies who raised you. These are your X and Y axis, two sides of a fence frame that could never face each other. Instead, they mirror the dark wood slats of the lovers who shadowed them. This is your cartography plotted by the finality of being birthed brown and girl and into a world a whistle's echo from West Virginia, where men's midnight mattresses were made with the soft of their granddaughter's flesh. Although they unfolded your girl self in that darkness, wrapped their shame in your skin, don't fear the topography. Set the map to that place just inside the hollow of your throat and name it truth. So, Clearly, I've come from some difficult things and some very, very, very strong women. But what I also had to realize that it, oftentimes it's easy or understandable, let's not say easy, but let's say it's understandable to get directed by those experiences, to live your life or to, for me to live my life directed by those experiences. But what I realized in that moment is that I need to be my own map maker. I need to fix my points inside myself instead of outside. So what if I had decided that I was going to fall into drugs? What if I had decided that I was going to fall into alcohol? What if I decided that because I didn't have a mother that I wouldn't be able to be a mother or a parent myself? What if I decided that because I never learned what, love, what healthy love looked like that I could never have healthy love? Where would I be now? Where would I have been five years ago before I started this mapping process? Would I even be able to use this handy dandy clicker? Would I be on this stage with you? This has been my dream to be able to click the TED clicker, right? <laughs> I don't think I would be here. So when I realized that I had been navigating around those experiences and those people, I started to shift my perspective. I started to realize that even though we're often made maps by moments, we can shift. Instead of not trusting my own tuition and thinking that it was I was acting out of fear, I decided to settle into myself and realize that I'm the one that knows myself the best. And I started to act out of that. 
I started to realize that even though I'd grown up with unhealthy love, that I could love and stay present and experience beautiful, healthy love. I learned that even though the women in my family had been severely abused and still stayed in those moments and still stayed with those people that they were abused by, that I knew when to stay and that I knew when to leave because I could trust my intuition. What I learned in mapping and remapping is to be my fixed point, to be my true north. There's this mantra that I developed, and I'm not a, even though I'm a poet, I'm not really a touchy-feely person. I don't really um, do mantras. I don't really do self-help books. But one day as I was working on this mapping project, this, this mantra came to me. And it said, I said to myself, I will sit in the center of myself so that I can sit in the center of what is. And in that moment, everything changed for me. The hole that was left by my mother leaving opened up for me, that the one that I thought it would never be filled. If I would have stayed in that place, I would have never married the woman that I did and I would have never helped raise a daughter, and that hole would have never been filled, right? All of a sudden, that hole was gone. If I was afraid to love, I would have never had these wonderful experiences. If I was afraid to move and step, I would still be stuck somewhere. So, now if I'm, what I'm saying sounds overwhelming, it is, and it isn't at the same time. One of the things I ask myself every day is what would I do if I hadn't moved? What would my life be like five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, right? So I wanna lead you through those same kinds of questions. So what I'm gonna ask you to do is trust me, and I'm gonna ask you to close your eyes. And I'm gonna ask you to think about some of the questions that I'm throwing at you. The first one is, is there anything in your own life that makes you feel like you don't deserve to claim your place? No matter where you've come from, what, ex what experiences you've had, what you've done or what's been, been done to you, you deserve to claim your place. So then the next question is to ask yourself, what experiences, what people, what moments have you fixed your own life around? And what if you said to yourself and truly believed I am my own fixed point. Where would you be tonight, tomorrow, a year from now, five years from now, 10 years from now? And if you don't say that, where will you be tonight, tomorrow, a year from now, five years from now, 10 years from now? There's so many ways that we can remap our lives. So you could think about remapping a moment in your life, an experience that you've had that's been really difficult, figure out how to remap that, or you can remap or remake your own landscape, the whole landscape of your life. Trust me, I know it's difficult, but it's also necessary. So that remapping process, you've already taken the first step tonight. So I want to encourage you just to keep on stepping. So yep, yeah, I still don't know how to make, read maps. I'm still in that same position, and I'm still working on the remapping of my own life and my own experience and those moments that I feel like I've stumbled over or that have taken me in a different direction. It's a consistent and constant process. But I know that it's completely possible. So as you leave tonight, always think about you've taken the first step here. Ask yourself, what if I don't keep stepping? Where will I be? And if I do keep stepping, where can I be? Because I've come from a long line of speakeasy women, women with veins full of dandelion wine and Jesus. In her 20s, my great grandmother got on her knees to clean white women's kitchens. She climbed ladders to vinegar shine their windows with the daily paper. At 50, my great aunt folded chicken into cornmeal and fried, and they all piled crispy wings and thighs neatly onto paper plates to serve for $5 to feed their children and their children's children. And I come from a long line of life ain't easy women. My great aunt, until she was struck almost speechless by stroke, filled pots as tall as three-year-old children with dandelions to make wine 
and I would watch her lose herself in the music her hands made for hours. Scraping petals from yellow stalks to soak in sugar till the sweet came out seemed to soothe her. Now she was not a moonshine woman, nor did she stomp on grapes from sunup to sundown or pluck purple fruit from vineyards. No see, her backyard was rock heavy and full of weeds with soil so memory laden that it was soaked with her dreams because she was a sweet easy woman who made her living. She was bartender and cook and music of the juke joint her husband's mother started before she was born while her husband prayed to girls pushed into womanhood by their father's hands just outside her view. And I come from a long line of deep breathing women. Women who measure sadness by the length of arm they can put between dirt and starched white sheets hung high on roped clothesline. See, they were all hardly loved by men that etched their brown skins with hands that held their cries suspended in moonlight. And I come from a long line of learning to love hard women. Women who as black girls fought to find their reflection in the slip between the spit shine of society's funhouse mirrors and the shimmer of grown men's grins in the shadowed outlines of their bedroom doorways. But you see, I am speak easy women. Women who speak when it's not always easy women. Women who word small brown girls into grown black sisters and cousins and aunts, and mothers, and grandmothers, and great-grandmothers, and great-great-grandmothers who learn to love themselves. These women who learn to love themselves hard. Thank you.